in my many, brain. Many, many french fries. Yeah. <laughs> Here, here is what I know for sure. There's a number of possibilities of what could have happened here. Him killing himself is not one of them. Bottom possible likelihood. Lowest rung. Murdered for sure. Oh, yeah. Body double swaps. Honestly, not outside the realm <laughs> of possibility. At this point, can we really say anything is too insane? Come on, people. This is happening right in front of your face. They're looking you in the face and saying, yeah, a, cu- a, fuck, uh, a guy in federal custody in a secure housing unit who had previously tried to kill himself was left unsupervised <laughs> also, long air enough quotes around to that. somehow kill themselves in a cell where there's almost nothing that you could hang something from and there's nothing to hang anything from. Oh, he just did it. And we're just supposed to say, okay, and you're selling us in no uncertain terms. There's What are you going to do about it? And that's why this serves two purposes. It gets Epstein out of the way, and it is just a big fuck you. We now have to walk around with that in our heads. We have to think, how can we ever think we're going to beat these people when they could do something like that right out in public, and there's not a goddamn thing we could do about it? I mean, this is like, you know, uh, a week after we learned that he captivated some of the leading minds of, like, you know, Harvard and some of the top scientists in the world captured their imaginations with a plan to uh, freeze his brain and dick and create like a, a teenage sex farm for uh, breeding purposes where he basically wanted his, his DNA to like populate the universe and take over humanity just through through ai genetics super and, villain shit like like volcano lair super villain shit and you know like i just him at a dinner party of like you know the leading minds of harvard and he's just like yeah through cryogenics artificial intelligence and my dick we're going to create <laughs> A race, like a super race. A super race of incredibly horny piano playing math prodigies. And then like, you know, Steven Pinker or whoever is like, hmm, interesting. Tell me more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now when we did the episode two weeks ago, it's just like, oh, well, I guess they tried to kill him. I guess the question is, how did, why did that fail? I mean, the thing is, is there's no way of knowing exactly what happened. Maybe the first one was him trying to get moved. You know, maybe it was fake. Maybe it was a, a, maybe it was a, 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 like fending off an attack. Who knows? There's so many variables. All we know is that the likelihood that it is what we're being told is almost zero. Almost zero. And why I would put it even beyond zero is the fact that on on Saturday, you know, when this news broke, which is like, you know, an an event that happens where like the gulf between what you're seeing can understand through your own perception and what you're being told is so vast. It's just like anyone can look at this and just be like, come on. Come on. This is a, like he got killed a day after these court documents yep. got unsealed, you know, linking this human trafficking ring to Bill Richardson, George Mitchell, among other people. And then also an, an unnamed prime minister and already Prince Andrew, the, Prince Andrew, the royal, royal family. family, you know, and then now that he's dead, there is no criminal case. Yeah, that's over. It's gone. It's There's done. no other it's person nothing. who's been charged with anything. So, oh, well, I guess we could just close the book on that one and dust it our hands off. remains to be seen. Uh, I asked this of several of the uh, presidential candidates at the Iowa State Fair yesterday, the senators in particular, uh, whether the Senate should convene hearings on this and maybe have some of his alleged victims and the people who have, you know, brought this case to light to testify and tell their story, in, yeah. you know, in front of the, in front of a full, you know, the Senate and, t- and television cameras. I think they deserve not just the chance to publicly state their case and you know the 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 of the accusations that you know of what have, have, has happened to them but also i think they're probably in extreme danger themselves and Absolutely. any more and any more they public, can do anything and any more public profile we can get for these for these women or you know to protect them uh i think is you know extremely necessary absolutely at this point. they've clearly gone rogue here they'll do whatever needs to be done to cut this off uh, and I think I, I had a realization. This is not a thing I can say with any certainty, but it is a hunch I've had. So the two more likely I'll, 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 questions, and uh, the two likely answers to the question, what happened to Epstein? Least likely is that he actually killed himself because he was so sad. Oh, More likely, one of two things. One, they killed him, snuffed him out. Two, body switch. Those two things correspond to two different theories, I think, of the case. One, if they body switched him, then that answers the question of the dead man switch. The question of how can they kill Epstein if 
as is likely being a guy in his situation, he has contingencies to release sensitive information if he is ever killed. So that means in that case, they would have to switch him out because they can't kill him. If they killed him, I think it's for this reason, or they were able to do it for this reason. I think that in a real sense, Jeffrey Epstein wasn't real. I do not think that the, what we assume as Jeffrey Epstein, like his life, his his hedge fund, his lot, his uh, network of properties, his life, I don't think that that was really him. I feel like it is a straw name that is used by the network and by intelligence agencies to move money around, to move girls around, to uh, to maintain properties. And there's a name attached. There's a body attached to that name, and it's this guy. And he might really be Jeffrey Epstein. Like that might be the name on his social security card. But he has no actual connection to the higher levels of the money moving around and the uh, actual uh, uh, edifice of the thing being organized. He's just along for the ride. Which means if he gets caught, you just fucking sc- cut the string and it's over because he never had access to anything that could have compromised anybody because he's just a cutout. I uh, will, will, I'll depart slightly from. Uh, I, th- I think Matt's brain has gotten a little too galaxified uh, off of this. The Jeffrey Epstein is not a real person. He's the Kaiser Soze. Okay. He's a name. <laughs> a spook story. He's a spook story. He's a pedophile. It's a pedophile like front man. That's my. The thing is, somebody yeah. said to me that the well, the best way to explain that is that in some meeting about the construction of it, someone said, "Well, the project needs transparency <laughs> in yeah. like awarding, like, in awarding, you know, <laughs> yeah. contracts and stuff." And he said, yeah. "Yeah, you're right. It does need to be transparent." <laughs> oh my god! Because there's another thing he did earlier that is in that vein of him just genuinely not understanding, like an uh, uh, misinterpreting an obvious word, even in, in the context. He was in the Oval Office with a reporter, and the reporter said, "You know." George Bush once said, George W. Bush said that uh, the Oval Office is an oval because that means there's oh, nowhere to hide. Great. And he goes, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, you could be in the corner or something, and but uh, someone could see you out the window, I guess, but there's nobody out there. <laughs> <laughs> so he took him literally like, okay, could I hide in here? I was like, oh, no, yeah, I could. Under the desk. <laughs> like, I, he, like he, he could not operate at the level of like of, of a metaphorical language. So when he yeah, heard transparency, yeah. the right. wall has to be transparent, he literally thought that meant you had to be able to see through it. President, President Amelia Bedelia. <laughs> I've, never, yes. I've never seen him sincerely laugh. I've never seen him be able to acknowledge the concept of humor, yeah. of figurative language. He, he has yeah. no abstract thought. It's kind of astounding. He doesn't have object permanence or abstract thought. What about thought. the... Uh, I think I actually have the most representative experience here uh, because you're a trump voter i am I you're the trump. guy with everyone argues because will obviously is, is from a family of of, of, uh, of fellow travelers uh felix has a, has a right-wing uncle but he's like an actual neoconservative <laughs> <laughs> he's so cool uh, he's, like, he's, he's not really man. a lumpen <laughs> trump supporter no uh, but i have these guys i have trump uncles like real guys like real dudes who are your guys who, who are your guys? trump uncles uh and they and I talk to them, and I do argue with them. Like I, I joke about being above it, but they bait me because they like, they like it. They like conflict. They love seeing you Everyone, get triggered. People from my part of Wisconsin, it's funny. Like Midwest has this reputation of, of all this, like the Minnesota nice, the sort of suppressed conflict. But, but like where I'm from, uh, the making a murderer town, people just fucking yell at each other all the time. Oh, yeah. It's like Russia, basically. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, no. Every, I mean, Minnesota, Minnesota, nice was never true. It just means pass. It's a joke. It's yeah. like they're just passive aggressive. But shits. like, but they wouldn't have any passive aggression where I'm from. It's just aggression. Illinois, so same thing. They all love yelling at me, and I and I get mad at them. And they and it's funny. You yell right at them, and they're just faces. They're just totally immobile. Nobody gets con- like. I think a lot of these people, they just are. A lot of these people freaking out about talking to their uncles. They're just terrified of conflict. They don't in their lives like per- like they love doing it on the internet, but they can't really. And that's why they do it on the internet because they can't. They can't have conflict in their life. It makes them too anxious or something. And so these things are these awful fraught conversations, and they, put, they like practice them in their head, and then they act like it's diffusing a bomb. And, but like, I've had these arguments just yelling at my uncle. And, yeah, th- there's nothing is changing. I remember one time uh, a couple of things he's told me. One, that the missing airliner, the missing Malaysian airliner, uh, was hijacked by uh, uh, ISIS guys in collaboration with Obama, and that they were going to use it for a terror attack. Uh, and then a year later, I asked him about it. He said he never to- said that. So at that point, like, what are you even supposed to do? He literally won't like stand by what he's saying. One time, he was talking about, this is before Trump got in, uh, he was complaining about uh, Obama wasn't doing enough about ISIS. And I just asked him, well, what do you want to do about ISIS? And he just mimed holding a gun. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> like, all right, yeah, let's let's just let's crack this one open with some with some like Habermasian, uh, you know, uh, uh, dialogue. That's not going to fucking work. I mean, they just they believe what they believe. They're very they're very self satisfied about it. Uh, and they find you to be uh, insufferable. I mean, I am insufferable, so I don't I I give him credit for i suffer you, know, you very easily right but i mean i think the older you are and the, and, and the less sufferable i am uh and you know it's just, it's certain, i just i still probably will argue with him once in a while just because uh because he will bait me but i've definitely given up on the thought that i'm never going to change anyone's mind this guy told me that uber was going to take over all public transportation why because public transportation doesn't make money and that's the problem with it Unlike Uber, that's thinking with both your brains, which has lost over five billion dollars, like in the past half a decade. There's no, there's no conversation to have that's going to change anything. And even honestly, if it did, people have this idea that you know, it's just it's something. If, if, I think they just think it's something that they can do that will change the world because everyone feels so helpless. And here's somebody we, in your face with bad opinions can that we, you can try to change. And I understand the impulse, but I honestly don't think it's worth the mental fucking anguish that it clearly causes these people. There is nobody in contemporary American life who despises the country as it's currently constituted, the things it believes in, the people who live here, than conservatives. Right. If you want to talk about the common culture, that is like, we've talked about this over and over again, that is the, the right's number one gripe, and it's the thing that's driving them the most insane, is that, that, that they have achieved political power but are still ostracized from the culture. Right, yeah. They want Everything TV from... shows and celebrities to reassure them that they're the good guys. Right. And e if anything that is doubled down on the, like, the opposite of that has happened. Everything from fucking drag queen story hours at libraries to Jimmy Fallon or fucking uh, uh, Stephen Colbert is, pro is proof that there's some captured, corrupt, uh, agenda-driven, uh, sexually licentious cabal running American culture. How are you supposed to say that these people fucking love America? And the thing is, that's fine. Nobody likes it. It's all bullshit. The idea that there is some America that we're all supposed to... That's an old idea. The idea that there's this idea of America that we're all, no matter what our differences are, we all come together around a basic premise wherein we accept America as a political and cultural institution, a, 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 a presence in the world stage, and that, you know, that's gone. That, 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 that we're, we're basically, we're fucking warring uh, Celtic tribes and fucking Roman era Gaul. We're, we're, we have, like, that's why, that's why, like, liberals spent two, three years now trying to get conservatives to get mad about Russian interference in the elections. It's like, don't you care that a foreign country got you, got this guy in there? No, because he's on their side. They don't fucking care. Because they only care about their faction winning. America has fallen apart as a, as a thing that people have any kind of commitment to across an ideological uh, divide. There is an idea of what you would want it to be, and then there is the, this ramshackle system that has, exists now that falls short in any million ways, depending on what, how you uh, diagnose it, and you are committed, if you're politically activated, towards wiping out anything within it that is against that as well you like that's inevitable that's what happens when uh when like the fantasy of, of a national project is finally uh, uh removed i mean and that's what it always was it was always a propaganda ex exercise and now it's finally breaking down and and people are still using these absurd old concepts to try to accuse one another of being being unpatriotic uh both sides do that it's like you're not taught there's there's no thing to be patriotic about there's no common accepted notion of america for anyone to accuse somebody else of betraying there is only their side's uh, uh project their their idea of what to turn it into for the idea that they would allow someone like selena zito to uh create this propaganda tour and gull some of their more uh credulous students into attending is absurd to me well what it does is it really shows one of the real cultural benefits for the elite of this post-2016 election exoticization, exoticization, whatever, fucking shut up, don't fucking tell me how to pronounce I don't know. But exoticizing Trump supporters and turning them into this other species, uh, uh, you could say it's, it's condescending or whatever, uh, or, but what it really is is it's, it's giving people who basically are too scared and, and worried and, and, and uh and cut off from people on in other socioeconomic areas and certainly in other races 
uh, like immigrants or, or black communities or true poverty in America, that's too scary. That's a, that's a bridge too far for, beca- for being an adventurous seeker of other experiences. But some, you know, a guy who, uh, like I said, owns a boat dealership but voted for Trump, you get to treat him as, as much of an exotic species as, uh, as like a, a Thai immigrant or something like that. And you get to then have an interaction that you're more comfortable with because the person shares your basic sociopolitical and, and racial background. Uh, but get to feel like you're a fucking Margaret Mead or something. Because actually going outside of your, your bubble of, of whiteness and privilege is too scary. Yeah, it's like it's the, it's the guy who owns a $150,000 pickup truck, but it's a pickup truck. Yeah. And he listens to like top 40 country radio. That, that's working class. Yeah, and you get that's to. That's what f- they mean by that. And you get to feel like, wow, I'm learning something about other people. Like, no, you're not. These people are just slightly different versions of you. They just grew up watching different television shows. Basically, this is. When you're rung down from the ultra wealthy who are able to do this stuff unilaterally, exactly, they don't have to worry about re- Anything, redrawing any lines and, measure, and doing yeah. ballot measures and and you know any of that bullshit. They just keep their money out of the public, out of range of public uh, revenuers, and recreate private infrastructure by themselves because that's the glory of having that much money. When you're a little bit lower on the on the the economic rung. You have to still do this kind of stuff, but the idea is still the same. As I said, I think a few weeks ago, it's it's, it's it is how one of the big things that ended the Roman Empire is that local rich people, local people, you know, at the latifundia, people who owned large estates, just stopped sending people to the to the army and stopped sending tax revenue up and started building walls around their little uh, things and saying, "No, nah, I got this." And that's what's we're seeing that recreated here. Uh, at, at everywhere above like the top, you know, like 10%, uh, uh, people are, are doing that. And yeah, it's only going to get more, uh, more prevalent over time. Uh, I do think it's funny though, and very revealing and honestly should even be an embarrassment to like the white nationalist types who see this kind of thing as a model and have, you know, like Roman fucking busts as their avatars on Twitter and post nothing but pictures of columns and are like this and is are how obsessed th- with eagles th- yeah this is how things should be this is the fucking white western culture that you're defending it has nothing to do with any of these ancient verities it's fucking cheesecake factory <laughs> and pf chang it's pf chang's it's this ersatz uh, corporatized poured concrete cheap ass recreation of of things that you never even experienced. It's just, it's somebody else's dream of somebody else's dream of a culture and you're getting just it covered in fucking MSG and high fructose corn syrup. And that's the fucking culture that you're willing to kill. What? Uh, three quarters of the world population to maintain. Just think of the fucking psychotic, awful heart of anyone who is motivated by that to see, to see all that death as like grimly necessary, not something you necessarily want to, you know, celebrate, but something that must be done for the good of the culture. And this is what it is. Well, this it's is a fucking cheesecake yeah, factory. Like, here's some of the, here's some of the things that uh, they have to deal with. They promote Fox News white promoted widely debunked conspiracy theories in order to raise questions about the integrity of Obama's victory. Most notable was a certifiably insane idea: the Obama administration was covering up an effort by a fledgling black militant group called the New Black Panthers, <laughs> who had been dispatched to scare white voters away from the polls. Another favorite Fox fable was that a little-known housing advocacy group called Acorn had helped steal the election through various forms of voter fraud. You motherfuckers you, hung them out to dry. Yeah, you they a Democratic fucking... Congress killed Acorn. <laughs> probably cost Hillary the election considering how thin the fucking margins were and how one of their big things they did was fucking voter registration. They got, they sort of scared her of their own fucking shadow because of some ginned up bullshit with a guy dressed like a pimp, a fucking trust fund rapist in a <laughs> pimp costume got them to fire Sherry Sherrod and fucking defund Acorn. You fucking cowardly pieces of shit. This is my God. Matt's rage levels are reaching unprecedented heights. Today, however, Third Way, Third Way is learning to live with Warren even as it embarks on a mission to ensure the Democratic nominee doesn't stray too far to the left. So- I do not think, though, they think that she is a contender either. Well, that's the thing. Is that, that is, is that what I'm Some people at. have, because Bernie criticized, Bernie pointed us on Twitter, probably not him, one of his staff members obviously said, like, oh, this is showing that you know the establishment is really only threatened by me. And people were saying, no, Bernie, this is a trap. They're, they're, they don't really support Warren. They're just saying they do in order to set you against each other. 
And I say to that, how is that better? How does that make Warren's candidacy anything other than a fucking spoiler? I mean, that's right. like best case scenario. They're being cynical here and they don't actually support her, but they want to use her to fuck with Bernie. Yeah. Worst case scenario, they generally have sort of. They're uh, saying, yeah, we, we'd be OK with this, knowing very well that she wouldn't. Well, right. I mean, but, but but because they know what the dynamic is, and they don't. A dynamic means Biden wins no matter what. But honestly, they honestly could be uh, reconciled to Warren. And I think one of the reasons it might make them think that is because even though she's got a plan for everything, the one thing she doesn't have a plan for is health care. When asked about Medicare for all, she suddenly turns into this sort of uh, this person who has never even thought of the idea before and is welcome to any answer from anyone. She hasn't put any thought into it. She doesn't have an incredibly detailed plan. She says, well, maybe we raise this cap. Maybe we lower that cap. Maybe the employers pay more. Maybe they pay less. We'll figure it out. It was all of a sudden never all the specificity thing. and granular policy shit goes out the window when it comes to one issue that directly challenges a key constituency of the democratic elite. Here's what I'll say. Like the, the idea that she's a, a spoiler. I mean, that was the argument made against Bernie Sanders running against Hillary Clinton. So I'm saying, Warren, that's a two-person race. You can't spoil that. <laughs> okay. The people don't know what spoiler means. A spoiler is somebody who comes in in a two-person race the thing on to a deny card. one of the other people the candidacy. <laughs> if there's two people running, one of them, if they can't, you can't. Spo- if he'd beaten Hillary, he wouldn't have spoiled okay. it for Hillary. He would have the nomination. He wouldn't I, have given the, I, the thing to. Okay, I, I, I would just, just though, stay away from like the spoiler narrative merely because I think people resent being treated as if they don't have a choice. Yeah. I just think there's a very small number of people for whom Elizabeth Warren is appealing. And I think the, you know, all the turd way pot project or whatever is, is very aware of that. Um, and they get to support her knowing that she won't win, but it makes them look more reasonable. Also, so people have to get around the idea that they can't both win. No, there's one president. There's, there's going to be one. Who can wet nominate there's going to be one. There's- Third, because the culture's dominant message about sex is still essentially Hefnerian, <laughs> despite certain revisions attempted by feminists since the heyday. That, of that, that, that was the Armenian guy who invented sexual harassment. <laughs> A message that uh, frequency and variety in sexual experience is as close to a summum bonum as the human condition has to offer, that the greatest possible diversity in sexual desires and tastes and identity should not only be accepted, but cultivated, and that virginity and celibacy are at best strange and at worst pitiable states. Uh, I want to, I want to, I got to paraphrase a friend of the show and frequent guest Jacob Baccarat, who on Twitter pointed out one of the central fallacies of Ross's point there when he says that one of the things about Hefnerian sexual idea ideology is that it prizes variety. Uh, but the thing about Hefner was that his sexual uh, aesthetic and, and concept was incredibly monotonous. It was one, it was basically a, a, a million copies of the same person. And, 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 and Duthat has the, cause he has a literal minded dullard. He thinks, well, a lot of different women, but all women who essentially look the same <laughs> because Hefner was a reactionary figure. He was, he was trying to bring back sort of the, the pre world war two gender dynamics that had been disrupted by women entering the workforce. And that, and that Hefnerian sexuality is, is conservative. And that's part of the, Part of his inability to reckon with the past the way it actually was as opposed to the way that he thinks of it in his head. Some men are blessed in this life, like Mike Huckabee. He parlayed his success <laughs> as an Arkansas governor into a career as a celebrated weird Twitter account. And, well, <laughs> some powerful men are lucky if they can sire one hideous fail son. Mike has been blessed with two. The twin AJs to Sarah's Meadow, David <laughs> and John Mark Huckabee set the standard for sons both fail and large. David with his penchant for dog murder and bringing loaded guns onto airplanes and John Mark with his co-starring role as Bumpus in the 2018 film Christmas A Revenge Tale in which a video editor refuses a job offer from Huckabee's crime lord on Christmas Eve and must cut a bloody swath of yuletide vengeance across the rented McMansion I'm going to assume it was shot in. Compared to the political careers of their father and sister, these boys are certainly fail, but much more importantly, these boys are large. So large. Just some big, beefy boys. The kind of sons 
you'd find sitting on the floor of your finished basement smashing light bulbs with a hammer. <laughs> sort of kids you'd have to hose off in the driveway after they get carried away during a county fair pie eating contest. <laughs> Just some extra large sons who love to rub house. Yep. The Huckabee boys, two for one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're I talking about double size there. That's, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know much more we can honestly say about them. These guys have been part of Twitter lore for years. They're the archetypal hulking oafish uh, offspring of a, po- of, a politi- of a politician. Uh, in their case, I think their failness is sort of mitigated by the fact that their father is himself hulking and oafish in every way you'd want. And they almost seem like kind of perfections of Huckabee rather than degradations of Huckabee. OG, they're OG large sons. And Indeed. you have to say something, you know, that says something for them in some ways. Yeah. So I want to start by talking about that document that we all know and love. The beautiful, beautiful parchment that we worship. The one that we're all going to be giving our come tributes to tomorrow on the 4th. That's right, the United States Constitution. Now, the Constitution, as many of you probably know, I would hope, was not the first attempt by the founding fathers, once they defeated Britain, to create a system of government for the the erstwhile colonies. There were first the Articles of Confederation, which attempted to create a radically decentralized system of authority with an incredibly weak central government and most power vested in the states because one of the foundational realities of American politics is that, and the thing that we have had to deal with ever since, is that the unit of the United States, when it was originally emerging out of its war with its colonial benefactor, the United Kingdom, was that the states had very distinct interests and identities, which meant that the job of creating a nation out of it was really the job of knitting together what felt really more like separate nations than departments, the way that there are departments in France or in uh, the UK. And the first attempt to do that was the Articles. Uh, The United States under the Articles was an unwieldy system that, for one thing, had debt from the war era unequally spread throughout the, the, col- the former colonies, different currencies, different trade concepts, and most importantly, diff- d- different states with different economic uh, structures and systems that were not knitted into a whole and therefore couldn't function as a whole. And so the Constitution came out of the, di- of the effort to knit uh, these things into a more cohesive whole for these individual states to give up some of their authority in exchange for a, a more centralized control that allowed for, you could argue, uh, the emergence of finance capitalism, all that stuff with Hamilton, you know, the, the consolidation of war debt, and all the things that led to the emergence of, of America as a finance-dominated nation. But because there was no gun at the head of anyone, basically, there was no coercion that was going to work because everyone really did have the authority. All these states didn't really have anything on one another because they did see themselves as separate. It had to be a negotiation. And so the Constitution emerged as the effort to prevent these states from ever feeling overawed or controlled by any of the other states. And that's the important thing, is that the, the, the people writing the Constitution, when they looked at the conflicts that had to be assuaged by the system of government they were creating, the chief ones they were thinking of were specifically state-based, region-based, but even more specifically state-based. And as such, that's why you have uh, things like the Senate and the House of Representatives, this elegant system where small states are able to gain some sort of foothold on power by virtue of the the Senate, whereas larger states still have uh, influence because of the population-based House of Representatives. So that was all an effort to prevent any of one state from feeling overawed by another. And then, of course, there's the checks and balances that they love to talk about, the three co-equal branches of government designed to prevent any one power from becoming overpowerful, a president from becoming overpowerful, a legislature from overcolor, by becoming overpowerful, a judiciary become, from becoming overpowerful. And the idea was, the thought was, that the dangers that needed to be checked against by these by, by this document were the dangers of 
some states ganging up on other states in some way, or of one branch of government overawing another branch of government. And we're taught that this, is, that this system was a beautiful and elegant solution for those problems. And, for, I mean, at the time, it, it appeared to be so, and it has worked to a degree. I mean, the, the whole sectional issue ended up in a fucking bloody civil war that killed over half a million Americans. So even on its own terms, honestly, the United States Constitution wasn't great shakes. The real issue is that all of the elegant checks and balances that are in the Constitution fail completely if government becomes based on coherent and disciplined parties. The checks and balances we were talking about that prevent one branch of government from overawing the others and, and maintain a system where there's uh, accountability for all, those fail if one faction controls all the branches, which we have now. We've spent the last three years swatching a gog as all of these norms and all of these checks and systems that are supposed to prevent a manifestly corrupt oaf from just doing whatever the fuck he wants without any kind of reckoning have failed to engage. And why? Because a ideologically coherent party that is allied with that president is also in control of the other branches of government, which means that it will never be in their interest to see him held to account, and therefore he won't be. So the checks and balances out the window. Why? Because there's an ideologically coherent party that controls all the branches. Uh, and the things that make the government work, the things that allow it to be responsive, the things that allow it to pass laws in the face of crises and in face of issues and, and respond to the popular will, those things fall apart if the different branches of government are controlled by different political parties that are ideologically coherent and have discipline, as was the case during the Obama administration after uh, 2010 when Mitch McConnell and the Republican House made it essentially impossible for Obama to govern, and he wasn't able to. Now, the people who wrote the Constitution and patted themselves on the back thinking they'd solved all these issues, they didn't imagine that these would ever come up, even though they were built into the framework itself, because they did not see the real divide being between interest groups that would have a stake in government. They only, the only real divide they saw was, as I said, between state interests, but the other real one, the, real, the one that they were counting on preventing the system from breaking down and from these, from these sort of fractions to emerge was the one between rich and poor, the haves and have-nots. And they were very explicit about this, that the government they were creating was one that was designed to essentially lock the poor out of influence of government to have minimal to no interest in government. People forget this, but universal manhood suffrage did not exist in most U.S. states until well, well into the 19th century, uh, and that the original idea for the Electoral College was that there would be no popular vote involved in it at all. State legislatures would meet and appoint electors, and then they would go together and elect a president. There would be no system in which they would be it forced to vote for any specific candidate the way they are now, where a state, their popular vote winner in a state, determines how their electors must vote. That wasn't the original conception, which is always funny when you see people trying to defend the Electoral College on the grounds that the, the brilliant founders had this idea that we should honor because of their wisdom. We're not, we are already av violating that by binding electors to the will of their state's population. At first, they were supposed to just get in a room and hash it out. There was no place for the commoner to vote there. And the, 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 the House of the Commons, the House of Representatives, the people who could vote in the elections for those offices and could vote in the, for the state offices that then elected the senators at that time was a very constricted franchise. It was constricted by property ownership in the vast majority of states. It varied from state to state. Some states had broader franchises. Some states had much more restricted ones. Rhode Island had a notoriously restrictive franchise. Pennsylvania had a relatively more uh, open one. None of them were anything that we would recognize as universal, forgetting of obviously the for fact that uh, women and, and uh, Native Americans and, and, and blacks were not allowed to vote. Even among white males, the franchise was restricted because the people who created the Constitution wanted it that way. 
And so in their mind, the factions that would make the system they'd created impossible to work wouldn't emerge because everyone within government would be of the same essential class. They would all be ruling class, broadly construed, and they would therefore be able to look out for the the common interest, which of course was sub, uh, synonymous with their class interests. And so that was the conception of the Constitution, that it was that it was designed to keep the, the great beast, as uh, Hal- Hamilton called the, the regular uh, Americans, away from the lovers of power, and to allow the, the ruling classes of the respective states to gentlemanly work out their, their conflicts uh, in a way that prevented any one of them from becoming too powerful. But what they didn't realize, and they should have, honestly, is that even within a ruling class, there are conflicting interests. And the funny thing is, is it's not like they even had to be terribly smart to think that. They could have just looked across the pond at the country that they were emerging from. Already, by the time the American Revolution had happened, the uh, Parliament of Great Britain had within it political factions, the Whigs and the Tories. And they were divided broadly by uh, what sort of ruling class they represented. The Tories were the party of the rural big landowners, the sort of feudal remnants, and the Whigs were the party of the emergent capitalist urban merchant class. And they were fucking daggers drawn. They were fighting all the time. And you would think that the American founders would have looked across, seen that, and thought, oh, what if that happens here? And instead, you look at the Federalist Papers, and they really just said, no, we're fine. And... One of the big reasons for that, the reasons that they thought America would be an exception, is the same thing that is the answer to any question of what is exceptional about America. What is exceptional about America? It is not that we were magically sprinkled with the fairy dust of Athens and Jerusalem, like Ben Shapiro says, or that the spirit of John Locke impregnated the minds of men and turned them into these these perfect subjects of of liberal uh, propriety. No. The reason America is exceptional, and they and the founders knew this, that they were uh, grounded enough not to to buy their own bullshit too much, is what Tim Heidecker would call free real estate. It's free real estate. The thing that makes America exceptional to all European powers, the thing that makes it its own thing, the thing that makes the thing that throughout its history has made America feel like a country apart, is the fact, the mere brute fact that there were always, for the vast majority of its history, endless amounts of land that could be taken from its native proprietors and then given over at basically no cost to white settlers. That reality is what shapes America's political institutions and political ideology and political imagination. Uh, Greg Grandin's new book, The End of the Myth, is very good on this, and I recommend it highly that any kind of conflict that might have ground the gears of government to a halt would, in the minds of the founders, would always be assuaged eventually by westward movement. Class conflict, both within classes and between classes, would always be uh, soothed by the fact that people could just pick up and move west. There was another native tribe to be expropriated from. There was more land to be given away. And as such, none of these conflicts would ever reach the point where they created a crisis of legitimacy or a crisis of functionality in the American political system. Now, even with that, even with that in their minds, very shortly after the establishment of the constitutional system, factions emerged. The, the Federalists and the uh, Democrat-Republicans pop up almost simultaneously with the establishment of the American government. And it really does turn out, it turns out that what happens is that the different sectors of the ruling class could end up having uh, conflicting policy interests. Oops. Uh, But the reality of that was at first masked by a geographic happenstance, which is that that divide ended up largely being represented through states in a way that was something that they had anticipated because due due to geography, due to... The uh, richness of soil and a whole bunch of factors. Uh, uh, the South became a slave-based agricultural society, and the North quickly became a more urban, 
uh, trade-based and event, and then after the industrial revolution, industrial-based social capitalist capitalist social social order. And so, even though sectional conflicts like those were anticipated by the founders, the Civil War still ended up revealing the whole thing to be incredibly brittle and incapable of managing even the factionalism that was built into it, that was assumed. That's I mean, it really is kind of astounding to think about. They had planned for that. They had planned for states having conflicting interests. And with it less than 100 years of them establishing the system, there could only be a resolution of a conflict over slavery through an incredibly violent civil war. So once again, take a fucking bow, you powdered wig-wearing chumps. I guess a slow news weekend, unless you're you know, interested in uh, Donald Trump going to prison yeah. and uh, all the people you know, lying lying and uh failing but it, it certainly was it's been made for some great snl i'll say that for sure man every time something happens one of these losers gets indicted or pleads guilty i'm just thinking oh man they're gonna go to town well you've mentioned this before matt but you watch every single yes, episode of snl I I, some sort of this is like a this is like a Maria Abramovich like performance yeah. art thing for you. Uh, this is like the artist is present. You're doing this bizarre feat a, of endure of public in, not even see, public. It's not public. private he's, he's endurance. Exactly. Self loathing completist. No, that, it's a flagellation. It's I'm sorry, never at this point. It's never been about public anything. I will tell people when they're all like, "Who watches Saturday Night Live?" I will opine, "I do every episode," but I did that long before anyone cared. Uh, and I will continue. And I, it's just, I need to Why? know what they're doing. Why? I need like to know a, what they're like doing. A, but like, he's I, like a monk for crap. <laughs> but like, here's the thing. I know what they're doing because I wake up like the next day and I just like, the Twitter will be like, you know, Saturday night, Alec Baldwin, uh, we really, uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, See, that doesn't or like rapping you. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> they do Remember do that? that? They did rap in uh, Ruth Bader. Don't tell me. I, well, I actually watched <laughs> but it. Like, but I know what they're doing. No, why you don't. I need to here's, see it. Uh, this is why. Because... For what? Yeah, the next day there's gonna be there's gonna be some article about oh they didn't about whatever the political uh, call thing was, but there's a whole ninety minutes. It's like an hour of sketches basically, or forty minutes of sketches realistically, and it's just peaks and valleys and different types. And there's there's the com commercial parodies and there's the long uh, opening sketches with the high and the high concept ones and the character bits. And I just need we to know, know what, what the they're show doing. Is. Yeah. Exactly, but it's it's I've a tapestry. Yeah. And if you're, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying, if you're just like, oh, the, well, they're, I know what they're doing. You don't, unless you're actually paying attention to it, which I do. Why? And, but no, well, like, how do you know? I mean, obviously, like you experience it on a visceral level, but like I'm intellectually aware of what they're doing. I need to know. You need to imbibe it fully. I need to absorb it, and that is why. Because here's the thing: everyone says, "Wow, it's so bad," and. Then people say, oh, people are always saying that. That's the, that's the sure. deal. And, and it's just lazy. All the talk about it is lazy from people who don't really watch it that often. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. So you want, when you complain about Saturday Night Live, you want like the actual cred. Exactly, because... You don't want I, when these rubberneckers who I are passing say, by on Twitter Sunday morning or whatever. Not pure. Exactly, because people could say this is so terrible. But I could say with full confidence, in my heart knowledge, that the political, specifically the political sketches, the Trump era political sketches, is the worst content they have ever done, like on a consistent basis. The worst kind of sketch they've, including things like Mango or or, or uh, the fuck, basically every Chris Kattan character who until yeah. now was like the lowest was possible nader, just awful, cringe-inducing, <laughs> yeah. just idiocy. But this is just you don't like the night at the Roxbury guys. Oh god, no. that was the better one because well, it was half I, Will, Ferrell. All Will Ferrell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that was to tolerable because otherwise you're talking about Mango wait, you don't like or Mango? Mr. Peepers. Just drag. Oh, wait, wait, what was the difference between Mango and Mr. Peepers? Ma Mango was there the... wasn't much. Mango was gayer. <laughs> no, Mr. Mango Peepers was was like a monkey. It was yeah. a monkey man. Mr. Yeah. Peepers who ate, was a... the, ate apples really yeah. fast yeah, and yeah. spit it up. That was the one bit. And yeah. Mango, the joke of Mango is that straight men wanted to have sex with. Oh, him. I remember Garth. Uh, Garth, Garth Brooks, Brooks was like, yeah. "Mango, please yeah. come yeah. back." And, I love like, you. and he said his classic catchphrase, "You can't have the mango." And then would smack his ass. Yes. So I could, that, that was oh, man. brutally terrible. Oh, man. Also, but, it should not surprise you that Chris Kattan uh, later turned out to be like a really gross guy 
regarding women and made some really disgusting comments about women later because when you play a character like that for or both of those characters your only recourse is to become like like an MRA kind of guy well it's amazing the, the track record of of mid-tier SNL guys who never became super famous becoming bitter reactionaries is oh un- wow yeah. it's on un- precedent Rob Schneider Rob Dennis Schneider, Miller Miller yeah. love it yeah. but, but back to current day yeah. like last week's SNL yeah it, it, like it's not so much that like like people can like I can't believe how stupid this is you are sitting there I assume not like you're not watching it live, right? Usually that would be, no. That would be ch- usually not, but sometimes you Well, I mean, do if just... I'm home and I'm not doing anything that's on, I'm going to watch it. If I'm not doing anything else and it's Saturday night, I'm going to watch it. But I'm not going to go. <laughs> I'm not going to cancel. Me, I'm yeah, not going to cancel plans Matt, to see it. There are it. better things to do I with watch, your Saturday night. All of these, all these other people who are just being like, "Oh, Saturday Night Live sucks." You're like, "No, fuck you." You were sitting there looking at like Colin Jost's like smirking face, and you're just like. <laughs> Let the old flesh die. Well, the new flesh will replace. We, we will live yeah. in the new flesh yes. now. You're just like letting yourself just rot away, like, you know, yeah. just rot away and be yeah. replaced in, 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 you know, a sort of post singularity. Okay, humanity. but I still don't understand why. Is this just to justify your hate? I think it's because I want to know what, what the normies are thinking. I want, because the thing is, people are like, who watches this? But it does pretty well, ratings wise, and it's actually. It's like the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. It's they it's, went up it's for the first ever, time. It's best best ever ratings yeah, with him. Yeah, People yeah. are watching this stuff, and I want to know. And it is really terrible. It starts with the bad Alec Baldwin impression, uh, and then all the jokes are just, oh, these guys are all crooks and they're going to jail, uh, and that's it. And also Trump's dumb, but just. Robert De Niro plays Robert Mueller, and quite he's frequently. awful every time. He's one of the worst people who's ever been on SNL. But what makes it interesting is that you could see exactly why it's bad, why it's so bad, because the entire comedic point of view for the political stuff in all of SNL from the beginning is just, we, we're not going to have an actual political valence to any of this. We don't have, we're not going to be doing real satire. All we really do is just take what's already latently absurd about this political figure and then just push it up a notch, basically embodied by Dana Carvey's impression of George H.W. Bush. That's the whole idea. It's like, instead of going, not going to do it, you go, nah, God, that. Nah. That's it. That's the comedy. Trump's president. Well, you can't do that unless you're going all the way like we've talked about where you have him wearing a diaper and he's saying, goo, goo, ga, ga, I poop myself, which would be amazing. If all you're doing is just making him slightly more absurd, you can't do it because he's already maxed out the This dial. goes back to an old hobby horse of ours on this show that we need mad TV to come back to like li- have the satire yeah. for the moment we live in. Yes. Would you say Robert De Niro as Robert Mueller or Robert De Niro in any of his SNL performances of late, would you say he bombed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but man, I, I've noticed that, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you share your granular and very detailed distaste for Saturday Night Live on the timeline. And you said that like, you know, this current iteration the political sketches they do, the Trump ones, are the worst thing they've ever, ever done on the show. Mm-hmm. And I saw, like, you know, some, I guess, I don't know, some Democrat or, like, resistance people get pissy with you. Cause yeah, just, like, it got you're into like, resistance you're, like, Twitter. They were, like, they were, like you know, me. like, just, oh, wow, like, you know, like, the one thing that's, like, standing up to Donald Trump. And you're like, do you realize that he, they literally had him had host him the show when he was show. running for president? <laughs> I know, it's amazing. And this, like, they, they, you know, like, that, you know, like, massively humanizing him yeah. or like making it seem like he could take a joke which he can't because just yesterday he literally said the feds should investigate saturday night live <laughs> he said collu- he literally said all the tv shows being mean to him are collusion yes, they're colluding and that the feds should investigate yes. snl for their jokes which is the most darkly horrific thing we could have is is toothless awful comedy like that getting a patina of subversiveness from the literal president, calling it that. How could these guys walk around thinking, wow, maybe we're frauds making garbage because the president is calling for their, he's doing a fatwa on them. I'm I'm, uh, speaking truth to power. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I am. Uh Making the comfortable uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm freaking Salman yeah. Rushdie over here. I mean, it is the worst of both worlds because the people who think that, like, the, the daring, cutting-edge, you know, the subversive comedy of SNL 
is being given uh, credence to by the president being like literally the Department of Justice needs to shut down Saturday Night Live <laughs> for all of their dangerous sketches. Yeah. Where like, you know, it's implied that I'm a know nothing, uh, half smart crook or whatever. I don't know. If they put Colin Jost in a black site, I might have to vote for Trump in 2020. I'm not going to lie. Which one is he? Is he the one with He's the, the, the blank faced, smirking college boy? Uh, head writer and Weekend Update host, the guy who said in a few episodes back that New York won the lottery by getting the Amazon headquarters and everyone should stop whining oh, about it. Oh, yeah. And they did a sketch about how Jeff Bezos... Bought, it was the most... This one like made me think, what are they taking in that fucking writer's room to even see the world through? Are they all on ayahuasca? Because if I thought... Oh, if God, I they're on stuff that we yeah, have never research, even heard Chinese of. Chinese research chemicals or something, because... Their take on the Amazon, this is the Steve Carell Oh, episode. the one with the jaw. Yeah, I don't but, like him or his jaw. Uh, the, the, in the Steve Carell episode, they had a sketch where it was Steve Carell as Jeff Bezos talking about how I, I built my headquarters in New York and in, in, in Washington and in, in, in Queens. And their take on it is that, well, that's where Bush, where Trump was born and where he lives now. He doesn't so, live in Queens now. No he, no, he lives in D.C. Okay. now, but he was born in Queens. Oh, yeah. So that's an own of oh. Trump. That's why they picked him to go there. And of course, they had a line there is like, and I'm actually a billionaire. Ugh. And I was like, I could sit for a year and try to think of an angle about the, the, the I would Amazon never, and think, yeah, yeah they're owning Trump. Yeah. They're owning Trump by putting it in his, in his, uh, in, in his hometown and in D.C. They're owning it. When you hear people, you know, folding dollar bills to make it look like the towers are flaming. <laughs> And you're like, oh, how'd you end up there? Well, it's less of, embarrassing than that. Oh, absolutely. It's less, em- at least those look like flaming towers. Yeah, because yeah, you know, that shit looks like the fucking burning <laughs> twin towers. Yeah. No, that, that's, and this is another reason to watch SNL. No, no there's no, no. I don't no. recommend anyone else do it. I will be the no, scene eater for all for of you. Yeah, don't worry about yeah. it. I will, I will be the interpreter. Is that it, it shows you the degree to which the powerlessness people feel and just the way that they're riveted to this thing that's a pure spectacle in their eyes. Uh, is turn them all into like medieval peasants, and they're looking at uh, fish guts and fucking birds flying doing in the augury. sky. Yeah. They're doing augury to try to figure out what's going on in the world because they feel completely uh, uh, helpless and just like they're at the mercy of this this uh, news cycle. I mean, that's why they had that sketch a few weeks ago where all the women of the SNL cast, cast sang a Christmas carol to Robert Mueller, asking what? him. To please give them the report so that they can feel normal again and get all this over with because they're just crazy from the news. Okay. What? Yeah. Okay, you've convinced me. Like, what? Yeah. This is your... Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so all the women of SNL yes. and by extension the women of America yeah. are begging this like ancient like fucking Herman Munster looking fed. Yeah. To restore like their dignity there was a as women, painting of him above their head when they were singing it. Yo, the Krasensteins could never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, Matt, you convinced me. This is the passion of the Matt. This is like your stations <laughs> of the cross. You're doing this every week. Yeah. Like you know, for all like, us sinners who couldn't like, do it, you like know? Jesus yeah, being yeah. flayed yeah. and having yeah. the crown of thorns on his head, being led to Golgotha, yep. and then every. Saturday night when it's over and you've seen all of it, you're just like, it is accomplished. <laughs> it is accomplished. You know, I wouldn't say that always, but in the last, this season and specifically the last two or three or four episodes have been so wire to wire bad. Not, not even the weird last sketch that sometimes is funny just because they're basically, they don't care. They're anymore, tired. And they're tired. They figure yeah. they're always watching anyway. That's where Sometimes there'd be really funny, weird sketches like uh, Robo Chomo from or, with, uh, yeah. with The Rock, which is, in my opinion, an all-time great, uh, great sketch. And that was great. only a couple seasons ago. But uh, e- even now, garbage. The last episode, the last sketch of this last episode, uh, the one with Matt Damon, was it was, <laughs> oh god, <laughs> it was Brexit Christmas. Okay. And it was a Christmas special hosted by Theresa May. <sighs> she comes out. She sings a song. She's got dancing bobbies behind her. And the joke is just, wow, everyone sure hates me because of because uh, of Brexit. They're really mad about <laughs> yeah, Brexit. Yeah, that's why. That, Jesus. It's like, wow, everyone's real mad about this. And some and the, the the last joke of the entire episode is 
she, first she has David Cameron on, played by Matt Damon, and he just goes, "Wow, everyone hates you," and she's like, "Oh, you jerk, you." Everyone hates it. David Cameron, too. right? But but he yeah. says they hate me and they hate you more, even though I did Brexit. And then she's like, "Oh," and then then that last next guest is a guy dressed like Voldemort. No. And, yes. And he comes out and he goes, and she's like, oh, wow, people hate us really a lot. And he goes, you know what? I really can't be associated with you. And then that's just the sketch. That's the end of the sketch and the episode. Voldemort. Voldemort. Mm -hmm. There's like nothing okay. anymore. Yeah. Sketches, have even, they don't <laughs> no. even have premises. I've changed my mind. You, what, you're, you are Matt Christ, man. <laughs> yeah, Matt Christ, man. <laughs> you are. Not you're... only that, this is like the last temptation of Matt. Because I, I imagine now, as you're watching the uh, Brexit Voldemort Theresa May sketch, yeah. uh, actually, like what happens is you begin to um, receive a vision of coming down, of, of stopping watching SNL <laughs> and living life as a man watching a funny yeah. sketch comedy show, yeah. like just watching, I don't know, reruns of uh, Brass Eye or yeah. you know, something like that. Uh, or you know, even the kids in the hall, or something. Oh God, yeah, classic. or Mr. Show, anything, or, or SNLs from like the Farrell <laughs> McKay era when they <laughs> yeah. had good sketches sometimes. So like, yeah, you received a vision of that of of what it would be like to live as a man, <laughs> and Can't not, you know, take on this pain for the rest of humanity. But no, like God, you know, God shows you that vision yep. to to make to to underscore how great the sacrifice yeah. you're making is we'll be praying for you yeah pray for matt <laughs> yeah i mean i get a little respite now because there won't be another one until i think mid-january so <laughs> I, get to, I get to take a break so uh your blair was talking about how there's always a baby and and you said i'm and then she said i'm baby and we're like no virgil is clearly baby no, no 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 blair's right she's baby oh no, you're baby well i'm baby in certain social contexts i can tell you guys all directly having just come off a tour uh, all five chapos are indeed baby in different ways. <laughs> you guys you guys are all baby in different ways. Well, I, hold on. I, all right. If you mean I act like a baby and that I have tantrums, yes. Yes. But, <laughs> you're baby. You're baby. You're baby. Okay. I have tantrums, which makes me baby. But what? I don't have I don't you don't need to like tend to me. You don't need to like you don't need to burp me or or soothe Bad, me. Bad, you're like you're like myself. a tamagotchi that we have to take care of on tour. <laughs> I did have to, I had to like uh, try to 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 pull you gently away from being too uh, aggressive with an old man in a taxi cab line <laughs> as you were going into a tantrum riff about him being a pedophile. You are you are baby. As I've literally I, I slowly held your hand to get you to the the Airbnb. Right, that's a good point. I was I was doing the thing kids do in, in public when they're speaking too loudly about strangers. Yeah, I've, I've literally. But seen he basically admitted to the me that he was a pedophile, so I don't feel bad about it because he gave me the little wave. Uh, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying you were baby about it. Okay. I was a correct baby though, because he turned to me and he gave me the frog one wave through the glass of the taxi cab, implying that he was in fact a pedophile. So it's pretty clear that within the context of the show, <laughs> the five of us are baby. Outside of that, in, in different uh, personal contexts, you know, it's it's variable. Uh, except for Chris, of course. Chris is not baby in any way. Chris is a full, he's a man. Exactly. He's an adult. He's a man in full, as Tom Wolfe would say. Whereas we are all short pants little piss ants who need to be kept in line. No, uh, Chris is uh, daddy and the rest of us are baby. That's canon. And that's, uh, you know, that's what our contract says. <clears throat> Ready? Ready. Okay. All I want is a joke.